God's grace, His mercy, is, it is pretty. And His peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right, we're in Habakkuk. Habakkuk, which I used to say Habakkuk when I, before I went to seminary, and I realized I was saying it wrong, supposedly, anyway. Maybe I'm right, I don't know. But Habakkuk, we are in the very last three verses of the book. Can you believe it? Um, very short book, but a very powerful one. We'll finish up those verses and then we'll carry on the theme of that a little bit with some of the other scriptures that say this uh, same theme. So the book, remember, what is the ultimate question of the book? How could you phrase it in, a, in one question, maybe? How long? How long, oh God? Okay. Yes. What's another one? How long will God let evil exist? Why is another good one. Yeah, all these are good. Why what, Susan? Why do you allow evil men to prosper and crush the righteous, and you, being a righteous, just, holy God, are doing nothing about it? That's the ultimate question of the book, right? And he starts out the book like that. Why do you make me see wrongs and look upon trouble? Etc. How long shall I cry, O Lord, for help, and you won't hear? So the question is, <coughs> if you're a God of justice, where are you? Why are you not working justice? Why do you let the wicked triumph? Why is the evil pers person crushing the righteous, and you, being the righteous God, do nothing about it? Well, God then answered him and said, I'm about to do something about it. I'm about to send the Chaldeans in and bring justice upon the wicked people. And then uh, Habakkuk sees this and he's like, oh my goodness, you're going to bring the Chaldeans in and destroy our whole nation? And he says, "Will he says, uh, you God, thou who art of pure eyes than to behold evil, can, and canst not look on wrong. Not that God doesn't see wrong, right? But he doesn't, uh, you know, he's a, he's a righteous God, sort of like in Horatio Hornblower. Remember when Doughty was caught uh, supposedly striking an officer above him and Hornblower wouldn't even look at him, even though he, he loved Doughty, but he wouldn't look at him because I won't even, I, won't, I don't want to even see my face, you know, that kind of thing. Um, why do you look on faceless men and are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Are these enemies going to go on forever, destroying the righteous and gathering them as, as if they're fishermen, gathering the righteous, people more righteous than they are, and a net, and continue to go on in this evil way forever and prosper? Well, I'll take my stand and watch, Habakkuk chapter 2. Says Habakkuk, he says, I'll watch and see what God will answer me concerning my complaint. That if you're just, why aren't you doing something about this? And he takes a stand, he watches, and God says, write the vision, make it plain, so he may run who reads it. In other words, I want everybody to get, to get this. Okay? Let no one miss this. For still the vision awaits its time, it hastens to its end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, this is verse 3 of chapter 2, wait for it, it will surely come, it will not delay. Notice how many times God trips over himself to say, uh, the vision, the answer to your complaint, Habakkuk, uh, it's coming. It might seem like it's slow, but it's rushing towards you like a freight train. And what's the answer? Or sort of like a, a wave to the sea, like a big tidal wave from afar. Oh, I, all I see is the horizon, Lord. I see no disturbance in the sea. Oh, but it's coming, says the Lord. And what is the Lord's answer? Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. Or actually, the better way to say that is uh, the wicked are haughty, but the righteous shall live by his faith. In other words, I am a God of justice, and I'm coming to judge the world. And I'm coming to judge the wicked. I will save the righteous. And I will destroy the wicked and the evildoer. The injustice going on in the, on, the, on, the, on in the earth will not last forever. It has its day, it has its time, but it will surely come. And when I come and show and bear my arm and show my justice and work my justice on the earth, he says, um, then you're going to judge again whether I care about the righteous and the wicked, whether I care about justice. It will be very clear to you on that day that I have been taking careful note of all things and I am indeed involved. So this God has, as Neil said last time, it's a matter of timing. It's not that God is unjust. It's not that he doesn't care. It's a matter of he just in his own select wisdom chooses when to act 
and when to stay his hand. And we want him to act now. God says, I am to some degree acting now, but I'm, I have a day upon which I will bring my justice. That's the day of the Lord, right? The last day. So uh, if this vision seems slow, if it seems like it's taking forever, if it seems like I don't care, don't let any of that bother you. Don't doubt my justice on account of it. I'm watching everything carefully. I'm writing them in my books, and I'm coming. I'm coming to judge the earth and save the righteous. And then he goes on to the rest of that. Chapter 2, describing mostly the ways of the wicked and uh, that God sees all of these things and will bring them to justice. So at the end of chapter 2, he basically said, he calls all the earth to keep silence before him, repent of their idol worship, repent of their evils before the great day of the Lord comes and destroys them. My people love to have it so, he says in other places. But what will you do when the end comes? On that day on that, when the storm which is coming from afar arrives, what will you do? There will be nothing left for you on that day unless you repent now. So, uh, chapter 3 then, we saw Habakkuk's answer to the Lord's answer. And basically, um, he talks about God's justice. The vision that he saw of the Lord coming to judge the earth and how we saw last time how terrific and how terrifying and how dread that day is. The Lord is a dread warrior, amen? When he comes, he uh, comes like smoke and uh, mountains melt before him and he judges the earth. And he, bes he will bestride the earth in fury and trample the nations in anger. That's verse 12. Okay, so Habakkuk sees all these things about, oh my goodness, I see the vision. I see what's coming. God has given me a picture of the future. And what was Habakkuk's answer to it, or his response in his body? You'd think he'd be like, yeah, go get him, God. No, actually, it was more like this. He says, I hear, verse 16, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My steps tot totter beneath me. Right? This is the Lord. I mean, when he acts, it is so overwhelmingly mighty, beyond your wildest imaginations of power, his justice when he comes on that last day, you'd think it'd be just like, yeah, go get him, God. It's like, oh, he's just almost melting himself seeing this happen. You know, that reminds me when they came through the Red Sea. Remember when the Israelites came through the Red Sea and it said they, they rejoiced with trembling. Remember that? How can you rejoice with trembling? You're like, oh, what did I just see? And I'm so happy that my enemies are now destroyed and I'm free, hooray, but oh, how the Lord has done it. Wow, boom, it's like, you know, sometimes when the rocket comes back down or the, the, and the, the sound barrier and you're not expecting it, it, it makes me jump sometimes. I'm just, I forgot that the rocket went up and the others are coming down and all of a sudden it goes, ba boom, and I'm like, oh, it's just, that's that kind of thing, but it's like, hey, but cool. Well, when the Lord comes, uh, it'll be such but he says then he says I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us so notice Habakkuk kicks the vision of the future God says it's coming but it's not here yet and so what's Habakkuk's response okay thank you God for the answer now I know it's gonna happen now I can wait patiently because I know the end of the story and I'm not doubting you anymore for your justice God Right? That's what a lot of people have trouble with, right? In our own personal lives, as well as the nations, we think, why do you not judge these things, Lord? Or um, we might ask in our own lives, why am I suffering so much, God? Don't you care? Don't you see it? Are you angry with me? Am I cast off? Why is there no justice? I'm trying to serve you. Why am I like, almost literally being destroyed here? Don't you care? God's saying, same with you. The vision awaits his time. The righteous shall live by his faith. So just keep trusting me. I see what you're doing. Your ways are not hidden from me. What's Job say? He says, uh, uh, he takes count of my steps. He knows my way. When he's, uh, how's that go? Uh, when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So even Job has the same picture here as Habakkuk. In the end, I know I'm going to become gold. But right now, it sucks. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, I won't doubt God, but of course, Job started to, didn't he? 
Okay, now let's get on to the last few verses here, which we left off. We only have three, four verses, actually. So let's see how this psalm ends. I had the, or this song ends. All right, so verse, uh, question 13 I had for you. What is Habakkuk's heart resolution based on God's answer to him? We just saw that. I will quietly wait. I'll just be patient. If I have to see trouble, if I have to see injustice, if I have to see all these things, I'll keep trusting you, God. I won't doubt. And I'll just be patient about it. I'll just be patient. And that's really what the children of God are called to, right? To wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. You hear that as a theme all through scriptures. Wait up. Yea, be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait upon the Lord. Psalm 27. Wait. It will surely come. And that's going to be a theme throughout the whole Bible. We'll see a few more examples later. Question 14. On how high of a high does this book of Habakkuk end? Because it starts on a really low point, doesn't it? The lowest of the low, it ends on the highest of the high. Because let's see how he ends his, his uh, resolution, his heart's resolution. He says, verse 17, Though the fig tree do not blossom. I never understood that. It should be the fig tree does not blossom. Right? But anyway, mine says do. Should not blossom. Okay. Nor fruit be on the vines. That's all stuff we rejoice in, right? We want those things, but if we don't see it, he says, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let's just stop there for a moment. What is he saying there, ultimately? I don't care anymore what my outward eyes of the flesh see. I'm going to believe in my God. He is a God of salvation. He's a good God. He's working great things. I just got to wait for it. So even if my outward eyes are completely dismayed and see nothing of God's hand at work in the world, even if I see, for example, fig trees not blossoming, no fruit being on the vines, no prosperity, nothing good going on. The produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. In other words, complete disaster. If I see complete calamity and destruction in the world, the whole place falls down like uh, Legos. <laughs> the flock be cut off from the folds and there be no herd in the stalls. In other words, everything is utter destruction, dismay, scarcity. If I see even all that, it doesn't matter if the world goes to pot and there's nothing left yet. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. Nothing's going to steal my joy from me and nothing will steal my faith. It will persevere and prevail, persevere and prevail over everything my flesh, the eyes of my flesh see, the eyes of my heart, the eyes of my faith, the eyes of my soul will see the Lord. And I'll keep rejoicing in the midst of trouble. Why? Because God is coming and he's going to set all things right. It'll be a happy, good ending. I, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He's going to save me. And he's with me in the middle of it. And I will joy in the God of my salvation. That kind of reminds me of Beth a lot of times. Because, you know, I mean, she's not facing the national trouble. I mean, we all do that too. She does that too. But I mean, like she faces trouble. I always to say to people on my boat, she suffers so much in her body, like she is right even tonight, getting over her double mastectomy, healing from that yesterday, or whatever else she goes into. I always call her the bluebird that chirps in the rain on the little branch, because you know, her bluebird's her favorite little bird, right? And she's cute. She's small. She's pretty little cute thing, Beth is. She's sitting on the branch and it's raining and she's singing and chirping away. When you think you should be quiet because it's raining, she chirps. And I always say the, the stronger and more the rain downpours, the louder she sings. Isn't that what Habakkuk's going to do here? The worse the rain, the louder I'll sing about it. And uh, Beth really, I think one of her uh, key, well, she's got a lot of virtues. She's got a lot of things that I love. Compassion, especially, you can see that in her eyes. She pours her heart out to people, all those things. But I think joy is maybe one of her best virtues, if not her best virtues. Somehow, she has joy all the time, 
you know, I have a hangnail and I'm like, and she's like, she's like going through having her body cut to pieces and she's singing and still laughing and joking and joying in the Lord. So this is really what God wants for Christians, isn't it? Even if you see nothing good going on, even if your life seems a shambles, even if it seems like God doesn't care, even if you see wickedness triumphing seemingly any way in the world, joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Keep rejoicing in me, God says. I'm with you, and I'm going to bring it all right in the end, very soon. Remember, the vision that awaits its time, God says, is not delaying. It's not lying around. It's not, and it's not untruthful. It's not hanging out slow and coming, even if it seems like it. You know, God's justice is coming to you very quickly. It's just our perspective is maybe not, you know, we want it to come faster than it does. But what did you say last week, God? You had a great phrase. You had a great phrase you wrote, said to me. Yeah. Um, sorry to put you on the spot. I can't remember it either. It was like God is never late. He's never early. He's seldom early. Yeah, that's right. God is seldom early, but he's never late. That's another good one, isn't it, too? I mean, think about all the times we think God should have shown up earlier than he did. The woman with the flow of blood for 18 years, and all of a sudden she gets healed by Jesus. Or, you know, oh, sorry, not the flow of blood. That was 12 years with the flow of blood. The woman with the bent over back for 18 years. You think, oh, why didn't you come 18 years ago? But I came at the right time. Oh, how about the flow of blood? That was a long time. It was 12 years. Came at the right time. 40 years, the man was lame, at the, at the, and then Peter and John come over, raise him up. And here's the, one of the best examples of all, Jairus and his daughter. Jesus is on the way to heal a 12-year-old girl, the daughter of Jairus, if I'm saying his name properly. I got Habakkuk wrong, maybe I'll get that one wrong. But at any rate, he's on the way there. Jesus delays to heal this 12 woman with the flow of blood, and in the delay, because he's delayed, people come from the house of Jairus and they say, don't trouble the teacher anymore, your daughter's dead. It's over, he's too late. Jesus is like, don't be afraid. Hey, didn't I tell you you're gonna, you're gonna see the glory of God if you believe? We're not late, we're not late. Yes, we are, she's dead. We're not late, let's go inside. Just takes the father and mother, Peter, James, and John. They go in. Little girl, I say to you, arise. And notice, when God seems late and he arrives in his timing right on time, it's the best time. It's even more glorious. He gets all the more glory when he shows up what seemingly is late. And it's going to be the same with the end of time, isn't it? You know, when God seems to be delaying and everything seems to be going to pot and all the world is falling into darkness, and then he comes, he gets all the greater glory, we get all the greater joy. It's all going to work out for the best. You, know, you don't want to open your presents on you know, December 2nd. You, know, you want to wait till Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. Then it's all the more exciting because of the delay. Right? It builds the anticipa anticipation, and the joy is greater. So... The point is, God's people, what he wants for us, which is difficult, is to joy even in suffering. And even when our outward fleshly eyes can't make sense of it, and it seems like he's not there. He says, keep trusting me. I'm watching. I'm with you. And uh, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Okay? Okay, verse 19, last verse. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like hinds feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. <laughs> so he started in the lowest of the low. He ends in the highest of the high. There's a book that Beth likes um, way before we were married, too. It's called uh, Heinz Feet on High Places. You ever read that one? It's like Pilgrim's Progress. It's an allegory. Uh, not quite as well written, I think, probably, but it's about a much afraid is the name of the lead character in that book. And eventually she, the lead character, gets feet like hinds feet, like the feet of a deer, in other words, and you can walk upon the heights of the earth. So the Lord, God, the Lord is my strength. Notice, when we are feeling weak and when uh, our flesh, the heart of our flesh might seem to fail and falter, yet God strengthens our heart. He is the strength of our heart and faith. He causes us to triumph. He uh, gives us 
the vision and the courage to see him and to laugh at our foes. Remember uh, Elijah's facing on Mount Carmel, 400 prophets, and he starts laughing at them, joking. He hasn't seen God act yet. He hasn't seen God come down with fire to destroy his sacrifice, but he's like, uh, he can have the joy of the Lord even when it seems like everybody's against him because he knows what's coming. And God sustains us in the strength. Okay, so God the Lord is my strength. Is he yours? Sure he is, right? He's the one who is upholding our faith. And he's the one who has uh, birthed you again and given you a new spirit. And it's his Holy Spirit that sustains and empowers you to triumph and not fail. And he says, he makes my feet like hinds feet. It makes me tread upon my high places. The hinds feet are deer, but you know, you ever see those pictures of the mountain goats that are walking up like straight up, or like rocks that are like almost sheer straight as like there's nothing to hold on to if you, even if you're a mountain climber. And somehow they're like running up like something like this steep. There's nothing to hold on to and they're just like That's what he makes our feet like. We can just run right up the hill where there seems to be no handhold or foothold. God makes your feet to be able to not slip. That's another theme of scripture. To be steady, to be sure, as if you're walking in a broad place, even though it may be narrow. Okay, so he makes my feet like hinds feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. He makes us tread, um, I mean, imagine he started in the valley. Now he's up on the mountain passes with grand vistas, cool, refreshing air, uh, up amongst the clouds and the mists and the higher ethereal blue skies, you know? That's where he ends this whole thing. Because uh, even while he hasn't seen it yet, he believes the word of God. He believes the promises. He believes what's coming. And his God is with him. So it's like he's walking up on the tops of the mountains. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? God, uh, I remember that one. I had a, one verse here from Deuteronomy. Um, of course, D David also said that about, he made my feet like hinds feet and set me secure on the heights. In Deuteronomy 32, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its feathers, the Lord alone did lead him and there was no foreign God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth. He ate the produce of the field. He made him suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. That's when God led forth his people Israel out of Egypt. So think about that. He's like a night eagle and he makes you ride upon the heights of the earth. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. He makes you to triumph like Jesus. Of course, Jesus had to face this too, right? He didn't see justice in his day, if you want to call it that, on the hour of darkness, uh, when Pontius Pilate is seemingly triumphing in wickedness. There is no justice. Uh, a perversion, a kangaroo court uh, set up to destroy him. And um, Jesus trusted to him who judges justly. That it's all going to work out in the end to the right. And uh, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. And now what's happened? He's seated at the right hand of God. Where is God going to seat you in the end of all this, all this earth and these troubles? He's going to make you ah, to sit on his own throne in the highest possible place. He's going to make you, and you already are, his sons. You're going to be clothed with power. You will rule over the nations. You shall yourself have a rod and dash them in pieces. Uh, power shall be given to you. Imagine, I was thinking about that because I saw something about Superman and Christopher Reeve recently, and I'm thinking he's got nothing on what we are actually presently and will be. And, uh, you know, we actually knew what we really are right now, which we don't. That's why we're here to learn a little bit more about that. If we actually really realized our identity right now and completely laid hold of that, Jesus says, nothing's impossible for you. You can do anything. You can do all the things that I'm doing. I was thinking that on my drive to see Beth today too, or maybe it was last night. I was thinking uh, on that line where it says, um, when you remember when Jesus stills the sea? Peace be still and everything. The whole nature obeys the storm, hears his words, trembles and and quickly keeps his command, and he stills the storm and the raging of the waves. And something that strikes me when I read that is, one of the versions, one of the Gospels says, and the, and the, and the, and the disciples marveled 
Isn't this the place where it says it? That, that God had given such authority to men. I'm like, don't you mean to Jesus, to a man? It says to men, to, man, to human beings. You know, this kind of power is ours as well, as, as sons of the living God, if we but knew who we were, right? So, uh, all right, so these are wonderful things. Did you like Habakkuk? Very timely today. Hopefully the election goes in the right way. If it goes in the wrong way, let's remember this book. <laughs> let's remember this book either way. Okay, our God's going to set us, uh, he's going to be our strength. He's going to give us the joy. And I'd like to carry on some other themes, if I can, as far as we want to go with it. Um, the Christian life is a future-oriented life. We live in the present, we do ministry in the present, we should keep our minds on the present, not worry about tomorrow. And the past is forgiven and gone. God says, don't worry about that, I've forgiven that. But the whole Christian hope, the whole Christian life is future-oriented, isn't it? Our whole hope is future. Paul says if we're Christians only for this life, why on earth are we Christians? Well, all we get is usually suffering for it here, right? If for this life only we've hoped in Christ, we're of all men most to be pitied. See, Christians, it, everything is like the whole of Scripture is like reaching forward like this for the day of the Lord, and then boom, everything's all happily ever after. But we should enjoy the present struggle and the present uh, battle because it's also glorious. And God's already giving us the victory internally, like with Habakkuk. And sometimes outwardly as well. Not always outwardly. Um, sometimes outwardly. Let's look at some of the future, some of, these, some of the same theme from Habakkuk. Like uh, Job, did he experience the same kind of thing? He says, why do you hide your face from me and count me as your enemy? Uh, will thou frighten a driven leaf and pursue dry chaff? For thou writest bitter things against me and makest me inherit the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest me my feet in the stocks and watchest all my paths. Thou settest a bound to the soles of my feet, etc. Man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Does he feel like Habakkuk felt? Oh, I haven't done anything wrong. Why am I suffering? I haven't sinned. I even made a covenant with my eyes not ought to look upon a virgin. Why are your arrows sinking into me so deeply, God? The question for Job to the, tr the test was, will you continue to trust me in the midst of your struggles? Right? That's the Habakkuk's test. Now, happily, we have a lot more scripture than Job and Habakkuk had to teach us even clearer and sharper and more brilliantly the future hope that we have. So Job's test was to also similarly trust when God was not yet acting, at least as we think he should. How about David in, in Psalm 13? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Wait a second, that sounds exactly like Habakkuk. How long shall my enemy be exalted up over me? How long will the righteous swallow up the wicked? And then by the end of the psalm, though, uh, Psalm 13, um, after he calls on God to save him, he says, But I have trusted in thy steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. Notice, future hope. This isn't forever. My present uh, burning sufferings and afflictions are only brief, and I'm going to triumph in the end. That's the heart of the Christian, future-oriented. Amen? So you can have joy and triumph now based on a future victory that is assured. It's good to remember because we all suffer in this life. Anybody having a great, loving, wonderful, awesome time right now? I hope you are. Hope May God prosper you, but most of life is maybe not that way. We're always, we've got a lot of things on our shoulders, troubles. Uh, I could do so many here, but let's see, go a few more. 30, Psalm 37, David says, Fret not yourself because of the wicked. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Notice, what is that again? What orientation? Past, present, or future? Future-oriented. 
Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will dwell in the land and enjoy security. To light, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, etc. Then it says, again, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall possess the land. Yet a little while. Sound like Habakkuk? The vision still awaits its time. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you will look well at his place, he'll not be there. But the meek shall possess the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. So notice, once again, are you troubled by the Klaus Schwab's, the Bill Gates's, uh, the George Soros's of the world? Why, are they God, why is God letting them live? God says, got my time. Just wait. I got all this. Trust me. And be tri triumphant in the meantime, because Jesus always leads in, tri in triumph. You know, you got triumph and victory today, not just on the last day, okay? Outwardly we suffer, inwardly we're heroes, okay? Inwardly we never lose. So, inwardly, the future victory is already inside of us. But outwardly sometimes, you know, like we saw Paul in the New Testament, that's a jumping over here. He suffered all kinds of things. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, attacked, persecuted, jailed, almost killed, cold, exposure, everything. But he says, but I've learned the secret of facing all these things. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And he says, this slight momentary affliction, it's just preparing for me an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's coming. This is only just getting me ready for future victory and joys beyond the wildest imagination, right? That's what God has for us, and that's why all of Scripture is saying the same thing to us from multiple directions. Uh, trust me, I'm a rich God. I am a victorious God. I am in total charge here. You're my people. I know you're suffering right now, but I got good purposes. I'm making you look like Christ. I'm chiseling away the world, the, that, the vestiges of the flesh that remain in you. God's been doing that to me too lately. Uh, I'm making you fit for the, and ready for the kingdom and uh, I'm giving you victory along the way and teaching you about myself. Uh, there's so many on here I could do, but uh, I'm gonna jump over to, well, let's do one more Old Testament one here. Got a few minutes. Uh, Psalm nine, David again. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Don't you love that one? I often remember that one. Notice, the needy right now seem to be forgotten by God. But David says, but they won't always be. Right? The needy shall not always be forgotten. The hope of the poor shall not perish forever. God's coming! He's got a white hat, and he's riding in a, on a white horse, and he's got silver bullets. And I don't care how many bad guys and gangs and Jesse Jameses there are in Dodge City, it only takes one Jesus with a white hat with his silver bullets, and he's going to take everybody out in about a second. Well, let's just say, for the sake of the illustration, he'll be done in about 10 minutes. And the entire brawling... Uh, uh, boozed up, gunslinging, wicked rapists, hoodlum gangs, Jesse Jameses that are overrunning the whole town right now. I'm going to clean all this up maybe five minutes. You know, right in and everybody, all, all the widows, all the children, all the honest men in the city will rejoice because the hero has just ridden into town. That's Jesus. The needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever, etc. Now let's look at the New Testament. Is this also New Testament? Future, reaching, pointing us forward. Aren't you yearning like a horse at the gate, or, or a horse in a race, running and striving for a prize uh, that's, that's before you, the, the victory and the wreath? Um, of course, that reminds me of... Uh, other scriptures not on here. First Corinthians nine, right? Uh, the earthly athletes do all these things for a perishable wreath, but we're striving for the imperishable wreath, right? We're forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. 
we're for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, we're going up and running, reaching for a silver, no, a gold prize, a wreath, imperishable, victory, glory. This is the Christian life. It's not only just stuck in today. It's running forward, moving somewhere. Look, look at the future orientation of everything almost Jesus said is future oriented. I mean, has present applications. But another parable he put before them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, what is that? Some future date set by the owner of the field. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the weeds into my barn. Isn't that Habakkuk, right? Okay, God, Jesus says the whole world's like a field. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to the Jesus who's sowing good seed in the field, or God sowing good seed in the wheat field. What's the good seed? The sons of the kingdom. The saints, Christians. He's making you to be born again, growing up with good fruit. Then the enemy has his seeds, which are the sons of the evil one. They do wickedness and evil in the world. The wicked, that's what we're talking about. Working injustice in the earth. The servants of the householder came and said, Sir, didn't you sow good and sit in your field? How, field? How has it weeds? So who are the servants? Uh, it could be Christians. I take it to be the angels. Or at least it's a possibility. The angels are saying, God, aren't you just? Same question as Habakkuk has. Um, aren't you a good God? But look at the field of the world beneath you here at your feet. Uh, there's weeds all over. Do you want us to go and take care of this for you? Which is, that's what the angels are going to do at the end of the world, right? They're, the reapers are angels. They're going to get rid of all the bad guys first. Do you want us to go do it now? The angels are asking the same question. If this is angels, you're a good God. You're a just God. Should we go clean up Dodge City? The answer from the owner of the fields is no. Well, he says an enemy first has done this. He says, do you want us to go gather them? He says, no. Don't go destroy all the evil in the world yet. Why? If you do that and destroy all the weeds, you're going to destroy all the weed at the same time. In other words, I'm working good in the world. I'm saving people. I'm working righteous deeds through them that they're going to get rewarded for in the end. If we go right now, O oh angels, and judge the world and destroy the wicked off the earth right now, you're going to stop all that. I want more good. I want more sons to be saved. I want more saints in my kingdom. I want them to have more time to do more righteous deeds that I might reward them eternally for so they get greater glory in the end. So you got to be patient. Don't do it now. Wait. Right? This is the answer from God in this case, or the owner of the field. So even the angels feel, I think, the way we do. But God has his time. Let the wheat grow up, let the weeds grow up, and they both grow together. Notice, God doesn't inter interfere. I mean, he does work in the world, and he does judge the wicked and bless the righteous, at, even in time, but notice God's kind of taking a hands-off approach, too, allowing a certain freedom for both the righteous and the wicked to do as they please for a while. Okay, and then it says, let them both grow together, but not forever, until the harvest. What's the harvest? A fixed day. And in the truth of this parable, it's really the last day. The return of the king. And at harvest time, on that day, I will tell the reapers, the reapers are angels, gather the weeds first and burn them in bundles, uh, gather, bind them in bundles to be burned. So the first reaping there is God will send forth his angels and they will course through the whole four corners of the earth and gather all the wicked and put them in one place. Ready to be burned. Sounds like a lot of other parables. And then 
But gather the wheat, all the saints together, and they're going to enter the barn, which is the kingdom eternal of joys forever. But all the wicked will be gathered together and cast into the fire, the lake of fire. Hell, Gehenna, the second death. Okay, so notice it's all about timing. That's what you said last time, Neil. It's all about just a matter of timing. So Jesus is saying the same thing as Habakkuk, is saying the same thing as David, is saying the same thing as everybody else. All of the scriptures saying the same thing. Forward leaning. In the meantime, don't doubt me, God says. Don't give up hope. Don't fail. Uh, don't falter. Don't be discouraged. I'm watching you. I'm with you. I'm a God of justice. I'm even today giving you victory. But I'm going to give you the final victory very soon. And you're going to rejoice in that day. You're going to laugh uh, with wonderful joy. Boy, I could say so many more things, but I'm getting close towards the end of time. Well, for tonight anyway. Um, uh, well, let me, just, let me just very briefly. Future, okay, orientation. The kingdom of heaven shall be carried compared to ten maidens. Five wise, five foolish took their lamps. What do they have to do? Wait until the future coming of the bridegroom, remember? Here's another one. A man's going on a long journey, called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To when he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Trade with these until I come. Freedom. We Christians have freedom. I've, given, I've told you how judgment's going to go. Here's your talents. Go get to work. You can earn rewards. Use your time wisely. But then there's a day when he comes to settle accounts. That's the last day. Future orientation. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him, He'll gather all the nations, separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then the righteous entered into the kingdom. The wicked are destroyed in eternal destruction, punishment, future orientation. And you could go through all the parables. They're very similar. Okay. So, yeah, let's see this. Uh, I like this. Ecclesiastes 12 says, no, Ecclesiastes 8 says, but, well, I'll put that in there. Because sentence against an evil do deed is not an evil dude, yeah. <laughs> because sentence never an evil dude. No, because sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the hearts of men, the heart of the sons of men is fully set to do evil. Isn't that true? Think about that. Because God doesn't slam people right away when they do wickedness, they think, ah, he must not see. He must not take note of trouble and vexation. I can go on forever slaughtering and building up plunder and doing it through un unjust means and destroying people because look, these people are getting away with it. He must not care. There must be no justice. The heart of men is fully set upon doing evil because they don't see God's hand. Christians do, don't we? We know he's, he's coming. God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The end of Ecclesiastes. Behold, I am coming soon, Jesus says, Revelation 22, bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? That we know what the future is and we know how to act now if we'll use our free choices to do what we can to have the best possible future day. So use your time wisely is another theme of Scripture. Get about, get cracking with the good works of the kingdom because... Uh, God rewards these things. God rewards these things. All right. And he's fixed a day upon which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed. And that this is given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. All right. And he's going to rejoice over you with loud singing. He's a warrior in your midst who gives victory. Zephaniah 3. And uh, I'll end with this one. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time. Zephaniah 3.20. And it says, I'll bring you home. I love that. At that time when I gather you together, yea, I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. That's in the future. Well, aren't we gonna, excited for that? Aren't you excited for the future? Um, you have future victory. God's forgiven our sinful past. And in the present, we're halfway between these two worlds. We still need to get forgiven. But internally, even if externally we don't have victory, internally, 
We always have victory as Christians. Because we're, it's the faith that we keep, it's the faith that we're kept in by the Holy Spirit that is the victory that overcomes the world. So you're always more than a conqueror, you're always a victor, you're always triumphant every day in Jesus as we trust in Him. He'll make you so internally and then also with outward fruit according to His timing and the way He works. So, Praise be to God, isn't this great? Thank you.